Hold, Necromancer. I am Ted Antworld, the pulpy shadow. Oh, that's a good nickname, Ted. Shut up. Ah, hello. I'm Wooga Sunny Gorged. Praise food. I am the killer of Twistbeard the Pious, whose insignificant name I struggle to recall. You who would prey on the helpless would do well to comply with our request or risk being slain where you stand. What madness do you speak? Calm yourself, Testry. You know, I think self-control is key here. You should try to master yourself. And that's what you told me anyway. Yeah, yeah, shut up. If you think you can do better, then please go ahead. Just don't smash her brains out before we get Kogan back, huh? Hello, my name is Dodak, but my friends call me Fishface, the Subtle Forks. That's a terrible nickname. Yes, hello, my name is Wooga. What do you want? How are you feeling right now? Well, I just put on a well-crafted item, so I'm fairly content. Ah, yes. Bone? Is that what that is? Bone. Yeah. It's very nice. Thanks. You know, you gotta do what you can. Actually, here. I have something for you. Is that... turtle shell? Goodness, how kind. Thank you. Are you feeling better now? You seem pretty stressed out. You should try to relax. You know, you're right. I just get a little worked up sometimes. This is so stupid. Now, now, let's all settle down. Woga, we need your help. It's our friend, Kogan. <laughs> Friends? <laughs> Who needs them? Friends are future enemies. I don't see the difference. Why do you think I live out here? No, I think you have it wrong. There's nothing like a good friend. I say, just leave him as he is. No sense in furthering your friendship, really. Well, I really don't want to argue. I require a substantive reply. You can see that friendship is a waste, right? No bond can withstand distance or certain circumstances. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. I guess we can murder her now. Not before we get Kogan back. Oh? You have an idea, Amiwa? Yeah, go ahead. Good luck. doing? I'm not bringing this guy back to life. Ah. Okay, that's it. You want him back? Then take him. Well, hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to the Watchful Eyes. Didn't really want to go interrupting that event at the beginning, so we'll have our intro now. And also, I guess I should explain what just happened right there. Well, as you saw, we met with Woga, the necromancer, who Ted tried to threaten. That didn't work at all, and so Fishface tried to be nice, which also did not work. And the whole thing ended up with Amiwa throwing some rocks from behind a tree, which did startle the necromancer who raised all the surrounding corpses. Kogan, the now damned one, as well as Galel the necromancer, who I had forgotten Amiwa stuffed into his backpack, but luckily it wasn't a problem. He crawled out as a normal zombie and was once again dispatched and stuffed into the backpack for later. I was still hoping to show the corpse to the elves at some point. Anyways, Kogan. Yes, he's a damned one. Something I should know is that after he came back as a damned one, he immediately started attacking that necromancer, Woga. I don't know why, but pretty much ripped her to pieces. It was certainly bizarre. Maybe he was just a little shaken up from dying and then coming back to life. I can understand that. But yes, he's back now. Isn't that exciting? 
Now, the guy hasn't really uh, said that much. He's a lot more toned down than he was, as intelligent undead people tend to be. But if we have a look in his mind, we can see that he's pretty much all still there. He does not feel emotions anymore. Nothing positive, but also nothing negative. But I should say that he still can have desires. He does have values and friendships and also wants to act a certain way in many situations, just like Amiwa. In Orid Ashi, there does tend to be a certain stigma against intelligent undead people, likening them to mindless zombies or something worse. But it's important to remember that intelligent undead creatures like Damned Ones or Risen Stalkers aren't inherently evil at all, not in the least. They could be just like every other thinking creature in Orid Ashi, though zombies or unintelligent undead, well, they're a bit different. They're a threat, to the living anyways, sort of animalistic. Their only goal is to hunt down life and attempt to squash it out wherever they can. And why is it like this? Nobody knows. The arcane arts of death are poorly understood even by its practitioners. Yes, it's all very mysterious. Uh, additional note, Kogan is now naked, must have lost his clothing somewhere in that scuffle. Or Amiwa didn't have the presence of mind to pick up the stuff or something. Regardless, the guy is now nude except for a shield and a flail and his empty backpack. Again, I don't know how he could have forgotten the clothing, but remembered the other stuff? It doesn't matter. Here we are. Naked Gorlock, back up on his feet. Right, well, at this point, night has fallen and we unfortunately are approaching a dicey area marked on our map as the Pungent Plains, which appears to be an evil forest. Not a place you want to be traveling through at night, and so now we make camp. It is a little unsettling to make camp so close by to this place, but it'd be much better than traveling through, that's for sure. Just have a look. We can already see the mounded heaps of foul growth welling up from the ground, staring eyeball and wormy tendril, squirming and fidgeting. Awful. Unsettling. And now we're going to have to try to rest up accompanied by that constant noise. Slithering mouth sounds. But again, better than going through. Now as for our next plan. After Kogan died, we were feeling a bit defeated, honestly, and the plan was to try to make it back home to New Chamber Point and regroup. But in light of Kogan's rebirth, we're feeling a bit more perky. As such, I think we would do well to continue on our trek. Let's have a little look at the map just to check our progress and see where we're going. Right, well, here we are, right at the edge of the scorching heart of Orid Ashi, the jungle of pointing. We had started over here, far to our west. A few days of devoted travel away. Our trek to Strap Range took us up to the north, through elven lands and the Honorable Winter, circling around the northern edge of the Ocean of Lace. And from Strap Range, we made a meandering journey through the Dune of Diversion, the Oracular Dune, and the Dune of Authors, flowery names for a stretch of fairly dull wastelands. And eventually, we made it out of the dusty dunes and entered into the jungle of Pointing, where we now are. We encountered Galel, the Necromancer, at the northern edge of the wood and ran into Woga just to the east, less than a day's travel away. I'll note that we did pass fairly close to another tower as we traveled, but decided not to check it out as it looked reasonably abandoned from a distance, and we were all a little unfocused after losing and regaining an ally in such short succession, but we'll circle back to it sometime, I'm sure. For now though, we're eager to get out of this area, which brings us to our next plan. Well, we're already headed southish, and we've done a good amount of looking over to our west already, so I was thinking that we could take a roundabout route over here to the east. I think it'd be a good idea to pass this way through the legendary jungle so that we won't even have to touch the fouled wood to the south. The only risky thing I could think of is that the last we knew, the Baron's forces were focused on this area pretty heavily, but that shouldn't be too much of a problem as, as long as we're quick, which I imagine we will be though we might have to stop and talk to some of the local elves. We really haven't done all too much of that on our trek and we've passed through a lot of elven territory. Might be nice to get some insider perspective about the locations in the area. Who knows what rumors we'll hear. Also some new mounts would be nice too. Yes, anyways, we'll travel through these lands to the Towers of Sweetness, a mountain range that slices halfway through Orid Ashi, home to its native rocks, the Titanic Birds, dangerous area, and after we get to those mountains, we'll have to go north because we have no interest in going over. But that's fine because we'll circle back northward and explore this entire area thoroughly in the process. It's bound to take some time, but that's fine. They aren't expecting us to return home anytime soon, and I'm sure they can handle themselves well enough. Watchful eyes, let's get some rest. We still have a long road ahead of us.
The next day, we continued to the east, into the realm of the hardy apes, an elven empire under attack by the beardless baron. The land seemed surprisingly peaceful, and we didn't encounter much trouble as we moved through the wood. Eventually though, we came upon a river that was far too wide to cross, but which led us to Route Valley, an elven settlement, home to the wood-weaving crafts elves and their shaping trees. By the time we worked our way into town, night was falling, and the elves had already retreated to the treetops. Luckily though, we ran into a bowyer, who had seemingly been kicked from their tree in an argument. We didn't press her for the awkward details, but we did ask her some questions. However, we were unable to gain any useful insight, just some talk of armies on the march, those of the Baron I'm sure, as well as rumors about the local rocks, which we weren't too surprised at. The birds are probably accustomed to hunting this verdant stretch of forest regularly. After talking to the elf, we bid farewell and well wishes with her now broken wrists before finding a nice place to make camp for the night. Sleep came easier than it had in many of the previous days. The elven lands were much more inviting than those we had just traversed, and the warm southern winds circulated thickly beneath the towering boughs of the forest. We awoke to a chill morning on the 3rd of Slate 1218 and continued on our quest. Though it didn't take long before we reached yet another elven settlement, Bowel Ravens, capital of the hardy apes and likely target of Scorch Fountain's forces. We nearly made a smart move and chose to go around the place, but curiosity had clearly gotten the better of us. We'd have to tread carefully. As we walked along the gurgling river, the nearby retreat sat quiet. Not a sound stirred from within, save for the always present song of woodland birds. Nearby elven taverns, once well canopied with rolling green foliage, had been left to grow with wild abandon. Something happened here, but whatever it was must have occurred many years ago. Bad news for the elves who had once lived here, but hopefully good news for us, as it was unlikely we would encounter any trouble. We continued our search through the quickly fading forest retreat. As the day approached noon, we had explored most of the heart of the abandoned capital, but tucked into a hillside we spotted an odd sight. The structure's architecture was elven in design, but unmistakably influenced by dwarven technique. Adorned with statues and intricate engravings, this small shrine was built to honor Nakgal, god of fame and rumors. A deity of the Glad Boulder, it was odd but not unheard of to see a temple to a dwarf god in elf lands. The creed of questing was a widespread religion and its adherents quite varied. We had a temple in Old Chamber Point, and even a member of our group, Fishface, was an ardent worshipper. To see a home to her god left in such a decrepit state was truly saddening, but she remained in quiet contemplation, offering silent prayer to Nakgal. The watchful eyes couldn't help but be enamored by the fine engravings covering the siltstone walls, dwarven designs wrought by elven hands, Elven designs etched by dwarves. It made for an odd sight. Images of plants and bushes mingled with those of rocks and diamonds. Elves, dwarves, animal men. All living lives in strange harmony. This temple was very old and stood as a symbol of union between the kingdoms of dwarf and elf. A fine offering to Nakal. But the group couldn't help but notice a reoccurring motif mixed into the detailed stone. A helmet. One even more distinct and menacing than that seen by Amiwa in the Necromancer's Horde. Its name was the Doom of Fiends, and it is the crown of Oradashi's biggest threat. The Great Conqueror, Lord of Rocks and Tamer of the Flame of Scorching, Moldath, the Beardless Baron. Seeing the etchings here on the wall of this abandoned shrine was confirmation of the fate of the elves of Bowel Ravens. Concluding her prayers, Fishface and the others left the shrine sullen, but with renewed resolve. Days passed, again in relative peace. The watchful eyes passed through Glittertail, which, like Bowel Ravens before, was sadly abandoned. But with no signs of what happened, they could only hope that the elves fled and now remain hidden in the surrounding wood, as unlikely as it seemed. On the 6th of Slate, a cool spring rain began to fall. The damp cut through to the bone and made travel unpleasant, and so they decided to turn back and investigate a stony mound that was passed earlier in the day. With any luck, it would be a safe place to take some temporary refuge.
Greetings, Kogan. This servant of Nightcall greets you. It's great to have a friend like you. Hello, Amiwa. Life is in a word, rumors. It's great to have a friend like you. I know they won't respond so much anymore, but they should still know I love them. Well, do me a favor and pay some attention, Dodok. Remember what happened last time we explored a cave like this. Hmm. Okay, here we are, inside this cave, away from the rain. Now, last time Ted and Fishface, along with quite a few other people, went into a cave like this many years ago, 12 years ago, to be exact, well, they had a bit of trouble and lost one of their friends, due to an Etten who had also made refuge in the cave. They stumbled into the creature quite far down into the cavern system, and it turned out that the Etten was equipped with a couple of spears that also knew how to wield extremely well very dangerous. That being said, I don't think it could hurt to take a little look down here. As I said, the other one was pretty far down in the cavern system. Oh my god. A large giant. Not just a giant, my god. A large giant, too. A gigantic creature resembling a human, almost unparalleled in size. It's a tight fit, but I guess he fits in here, huh? Ugly bastard. Mm. All right. What was that? Gonna run back a little bit here. Jumping up out of this hole. Probably just a troglodyte or something. And back to the original entryway. Gonna wait a second now. Hopefully it doesn't come up. Doesn't sound like it is though. Excellent. Okay. We're good. That being said, I kinda do want to check it out again. That one was not armed like that Etten back in the day. And also, it didn't really seem, well, immediately threatening. Maybe we could start up a conversation with a guy. But Ted's doing this by herself. Alright, yeah, back down here. The giant is still around that corner, I assume. I'm just going to shout right now. My name is Ted Antworld, the Pulpy Shadow. Silence. Nothing. I'm sure it heard me, though. It has to have. Assuming it's still there, I suppose. Gonna take a step forward. Oh, yeah. There it is. Yeah, completely unarmed, the ugly bastard. This must be its lair. Certainly seems comfortable enough. My name is Ted Antworld, the Pulpy Shadow. Mm. You can talk all you want, but you're a dangerous animal and you're in my hell. Goodbye, Ted. Okay, guess we're doing this. It's definitely aggressive now, coming right in. Gonna try going for his foot. We've had a lot of experience with Cyclops and Old Chamber Point, and that seems to be the way to go. You little bastard! Ooh, not bad. All right, tell you what, I'm gonna run over here behind this pillar. Get back here! And the giant is coming. I can hear it. I am the strangler of Mimala Sept Droplet, whom I buried alive under a mountain of hatred. <sighs> I've been injured badly, you little bastard. Alright, gonna slow it down to a creep. Start sneaking. Also gonna drop down to the ground. Okay. Not the best sneaker here. Gonna have to move right up to the giant. The giant is on the ground, looking towards the east. Praying for the best here. <laughs> that was surprisingly quick. Yep, yeah, no biggie. Just a giant. Nothing we can't handle, right? Ted stood over the fallen giant ankle deep in its life essence. Kosiaspgu Zoliasma, her marvelous silver blade, had drank deeply of the monster's blood. Both it and Ted were well satisfied with this brutal task. The watchful eyes had become strong, much stronger than in those dark days twelve years ago, or even in the days of old Chamber Point. Their legend had only begun to blossom. Stealing themselves, they marched further into the cavern, confident in their ability to dispose of any threat. But no other threats lurked in the depths of those long-forgotten tunnels, save for a few scattered troglodytes, easily dispatched. 
Continuing down, they soon sensed a warm humidity in the air, alongside the mellow aroma of mushroom spores. Sure enough, the cave led them into the caverns below, land of darkness and life, and home to a vast ecosystem. Though exploration would have to wait, traversing the depths would be a foolish prospect without a proper map or the help of dwarven underroads. And so, returning to the surface, the group took refuge in the upper caverns, making camp and waiting patiently for the spring rains to tire. Frost-covered grasses crunched underfoot as they continued on their way the following morning. Wandering in silence through the sensual plains, the group wondered at how long this journey might take, only now realizing the enormity of the task before them. Night came and went. Another, and yet, another. Besides the ever-present pack of dingoes that seemed to infest the region, the trail was peaceful, and their movement, swift. On the tenth of slate, the wandering eyes spied a low mound of rock, sitting alone within the forest of dirt. Once again taken by curiosity, they made their way inside. The cave, similar to the last minus the rank stink of giant habitation, seemed clear, and so they traveled downwards. Before long, they once again felt the humid air of the caverns welling up from below, and sure enough, they were once again greeted by the musky caverns, and once again, they decided to exit. But not before they heard a mysterious noise nearby. Something moved in the darkness. Lithe forms stood stoic, shrouded in dark. A half dozen or so, adorned with twisted knots of fur and wielding a variety of peculiar weapons, the watchful eyes had crossed paths with a wandering tribe of bat folk. Startled by the strange encounter, Ted started off with a barrage of threats, listing many of her previous kills, including the giant, of course, which, in an odd turn, went a long way towards impressing the tribe, and soon the bats became quite eager to join the watchful eyes. Thanks to Dodok's pleading, they were allowed to tag along, though it was unlikely they fully grasped the quest's gravity. At this point in the journey, the party had reached the scenic western edge of the Towers of Sweetness, and their path turned sharply northward. The Batmen were relatively quiet during the trip, keeping mostly to themselves, a great bother to Fishface, who was now starved for meaningful conversation. The Bats were five in number, armed with funky wood spears and crude blowguns, and with dubious skill to back it up. Two Batmen had stayed behind in the caves and in the following days, one that agreed to come disappeared in the night, either in an attempt to return home or becoming lost in the surrounding wood. In either case, the remaining four were totally unperturbed, choosing instead to keep pace with the group. All throughout the trip, the watchful eyes were harried by shadows, gangly loping forms just inside the tree line. Yipping and baying, the dingoes were an ever-present nuisance. Oftentimes, small packs would ambush the party as they made camp for the evening. Both the normal four-legged canines as well as their sentient two-legged kin, the fiends would dart in, foolishly attempting to pull away a bat before being put down. A nuisance, yes. No threat at all. That is, until the early morning of the 13th of Slate. The night had passed quietly, cold as they had been, but quiet. The watchful eyes were camped in a narrow valley tucked into the mountains, a dead end that kept them safe from biting winds. Sore from sleeping on gravel-strewn earth, they had begun to wake, stirred from their rest by the rhythmic thrum of many heavy paws. Giant Dingoes Nearly a dozen of the mule-sized monsters had tracked the party down and was swiftly upon them. The watchful eyes had taken giant dingoes before, but never in numbers this great. One of the bats fell early on in the fight, followed by yet another, ripped to shreds in the savage clutch of the dingoes. The remaining eyes were spread thin as Ted faced off against a pair of the snarling brutes. They fought with annoying efficiency, staying just out of the glittering sword's reach. Focused as she was on the other eyes, she hardly took notice of her mounting wounds. Snapping teeth tore at her face, Frantic, scraping claws dug into her flesh. Powerful jaws clamped over Ted's hand, shattering her gauntlet and ruining her grip. And yet, she continued the fight. Her failing body, kept alive with adrenaline, streamed with blood. But by the sun's rising, Ted and the watchful eyes had won out. The dingoes lay dead and dying alongside two of their new companions. 
but as the remaining members of the party gathered around to assess damage, they stared grimly at the ravaged face of their leader. At some point in the battle, Ted's nose had been ripped away from her face, leaving only a bloody, gaping hole. The mark of this encounter would accompany the Testry until her dying day. Their guard was raised high in the coming nights as they camped in the hidden mountain nook. They realized that Ted had been much more severely wounded than they originally thought, even beyond her nose. Her main concern being the dingo bitten hand that had now refused function. Wielding her blade was still possible, but would take some getting used to. As for her mangled snout, Fishface seemed to have a solution. A carved dingo bone nose worn about her face to protect the sensitive area. Ted took the item, but was understandably reluctant to wear the thing. The eyes crept from their secluded nook on the 17th and resumed their lengthy trek with a fair bit more respect for the surrounding lands and the threats therein. The going went well, and luckily, no more serious threats were encountered on the trail. On the 20th, one of the two remaining bats disappeared into the night, like their comrades before. Only one of the cave dwellers now remained. Days passed, and then weeks, as the party carved away at the journey. They found that their spirits gradually strengthened alongside their progress, even despite the lack of any necromancer activity, or any activity at all. The lands west of the mountains were shockingly desolate, which turned out to make the journey pass incredibly fast. Before they knew it, it was the fourth of Felsite, late in the spring, and their circuit had come full circle, finishing up with a tower that they had spied a full month ago, which yes, was abandoned. The watchful eyes looked back at their journey with wonder. They had covered an amazing amount of ground for a month's time, but still, they knew they had far to go if the world was to be rid of necromancy. For now though, the road led home, back to New Chamber Point where they could plan the next leg of their quest, something they were very eager to get on with. By now, Ted had grown accustomed to her new nose. She found herself incredibly grateful for Dodok's friendship. Well, hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back to the end of the episode. We're going to be talking about some behind the scenes things really quick, too, because this episode went on longer than usual. Right now, a couple things I want to mention is that, well, first off, Ted's new nose there. That is an actual item in the game, not a nose guard, mind you, that doesn't exist in Dwarf Fortress, but it's an amulet. While we were resting there, I kind of just like, I was carving things, carving things with Dodok to get her bone carving skill up just for the hell of it. And I figured, what the hell? The amulet goes on the head, so what could we do with that? Nose guard, perfect. Its only description is a bone amulet, so I figure that's open to interpretation. Something else regarding fish face, actually, her helmet. I'm surprised nobody's asked about it, but it looks a bit different than it used to. Now, if you watch the old Scorch Fountain episodes where we first saw that helmet, it didn't look like that. We found this helmet out in the wild somewhere, I think in a, in a necromancer's den. Thob did, one of Fishface's friends. And this is like behind the scenes sort of stuff, but like when we found it, it had a picture of an Iron Man and a ruby on it. But then when we left that last fortress, Chamber Point, I actually went and found this helmet so we could take it with us. And the the image was changed. I have to assume that's some, some sort of a bug or something. Kind of weird, I haven't seen that before. Also, one last thing I'll mention, because it's pretty neat, is that, well, we have Kogan now as a damned one. We also have Amiwa the Risen Stalker. I've mentioned a few times that they don't really like talking that much, and they don't. They won't talk at all, unless you like take control of them, then you could speak as them. I could even go as Ted and ask Amiwa a question, and then switch to Amiwa and see the prompt to answer that question, but they don't talk by themselves. So that's why I'm kind of playing it like that, I thought it was kind of cool. Anyways, yeah, I'm probably out of time here. So, my bearded bastards, I thank you so much for watching, I do truly appreciate it. And I certainly hope to see you next time here with the watchful eyes. And until then, my bearded bastards. Mm -hmm.